You know, given how bad the Naked Now is over in TNG, my first reaction was, Oh, God, not this again. Turned out to be a lot better than I was expecting. Probably because this is actually a character piece, rather than whatever the hell was going on in that other one. This was written by John Black. Um, actually, funny story. He was working on this episode, and it caused some issues, because he was a story consultant and a story editor for the show for most of the first season. So we'll see his name crop up a few more times. I've actually mentioned him a couple times already. And this was another one directed by Mark Daniels. So we've got some recurrence going on. Good, good. I do like this episode. Let me go ahead and get that out up front. What I find interesting is Roddenberry rewrote parts of this episode without consulting anyone or telling anyone. Now, I suppose that is his right, but... That is the kind of thing that Roddenberry would do a lot at this point in history, and it just kind of makes me raise an eyebrow. Like, like why not just tell people? Actually, I do have a theory for why that is. See, Roddenberry had this thing where he doesn't like to look like the bad guy. That's one of the reasons he had Meislich was to, which I'm probably mispronouncing his name, but screw him, uh, in order to be the bad guy so that Roddenberry could maintain the face and be the good guy. And that probably sounds horrible, but I've actually known people like that in real life. So I suppose that's just kind of what it is. Uh, George Takei, when involved in this episode, it's like, hey, take off your shirt. Okay, and he took off his shirt. It's like, okay, uh, we're going to film you shirtless for some fencing scenes. And Takei apparently decided to do push-ups for all of his free time for the next couple of days leading up to this, which is amusing. He also spent three weeks learning fencing for, in preparation for his scenes, which is actually pretty cool, and, and credit to him on that one. But... Before we go any further, while this episode does have several firsts, we have to talk about Majel Barrett. Now, I think I've made it clear on both my TNG and my DS9 stuff that I think she's cool. <sighs> or at least she was. Um, you know, when she was still with us. But, you know, Majel Barrett, yeah, awesome. Uh, good person. Nice heart. Uh, in many ways considered the emotional core of Star Trek fandom, and for good freaking reason. I'm not sure how that happened, if I'm being completely honest. See, here's the thing. If I was to ask you right now, how many of you dislike Loxana Troy? How many of you would raise your hands? Now, I won't, because I just went through TNG and DS9, and I found out that the number of episodes where I dislike her actually is outnumbered, by the number of episodes where I do like her. It's just, I remember the episodes where I dislike her a lot more because they're just really, really grating. It's kind of a similar problem I had with um, Pulaski. You know, I remembered her first couple episodes, which were just, Ugh! But then she's fine after that. So, you know, problems. Anyways, no judgment, by the way. How many of you dislike Nurse Chapel? Now, I haven't rewatched TOS recently, so I can't really comment on that. I did some digging into the character because I was curious. Turns out Star Trek IV is the last time Nurse Chapel appears in Star Trek. So there's no nice or sugar-coated way to put this. So let's just go ahead and get this out there. Majel Barrett was having an extramarital affair with Gene Roddenberry. Or to be slightly more accurate, he was with her. He was married at the time. And his, that marriage and that divorce would actually cause substantial issues for Star Trek for many, many years. Up in, in the, the Issues that honestly were only actually terminated because he died. They were still in litigation, as I've reported on before, when Mr. Roddenberry passed away. So that sucks. Now, I'm not saying this to judge, by the way. I, I swear this is actually relevant. So let me just build up to this, okay? So the two were kind of a couple. Cool. And as a consequence, he wanted to get her in on his show. Basically, everyone at NBC, when they found out about her being cast as Chapel, correctly guessed that this was because she was sleeping with someone, and it turned out to be true. Now, this sucks, because I've seen Majel Barrett's acting, and she can act. And multiple accounts agree on the same point. It wasn't actually the problem of the actress, it was a problem of the role. And here's, here's, here was, here's where this kind of lines up, because Justman in particular just was like, what the crap, Robert Justman? He was just, what is... Nurse Chapel's flat and boring and dumb, and we need to get rid of this role. And Ron Bear's like, no, no, it's fine. Everything's fine. Smile. Being the good guy, you know, everything's cool. Change the subject. The problem is Nurse Chapel is an extremely one-dimensional character. 
that was clearly just designed to be a role for her to play. Uh, Majel Barrett herself has mentioned in several uh, interviews and published works that she wanted to push for Chapel to be an actual character, but she didn't want to push too hard because she was afraid of losing her job again. Remember that she'd already lost the number one post because of after the events of the cage. So she didn't. She felt like she was in hot water, and she was right. This is when the extramarital thing comes in. See, Lucille Ball was the head of the studio. Yes, the head of the entire studio of Desilu wanted to fire both Barrett and Roddenberry, along with some people over at Mission Impossible, because of this whole thing, because she was very against that kind of extramarital thing, just on a morality perspective. It took Solo substantial and significant effort to convince her not to do that. So her job was in danger. And so was Roddenberry's. And so she felt like she just kind of had to accept the role and go with it, which is a damn shame because, as I've said before, we've seen Majel Barrett act. It took a while in TNG as well, which is where this theory comes in. Everything I've mentioned so far is, is part of written record and probably true. You know, asterisk as always when it comes to historical events. When it comes to Loxana, though, having learned more about the history of Majel Barrett and having dug into this, I have a really strong feeling that Loxana Troy was designed to be Majel Barrett 2.0. Here, I'm going to give my girlfriend a job in a one-dimensional, flat role. You'll notice that Loxana is fleshed out into an actual character after Roddenberry passed away. And they actually start doing stuff with her as a character over on Deep Space Nine, well after any of that. So yeah, that sucks. <laughs> I just... Of all the things to have to deal with, God, I just... Mm. Yikes. <sighs> Moving on. Oh, God. So, let, let's talk about the episode proper, now that we've gotten that out of the way. That, that wonderful awfulness. But yeah, that, this is Chapel's first episode. Oh, by the way, you'll notice that in her very first episode, she's in love with Mr. Spock. I hope you enjoy that, because that is effectively her only character trait, is being the nurse and being in love with Mr. Spock. It's okay, she'll pine after someone else uh, in, like, ten episodes. In uh, what, what are little girls made of? That'll be a thing. So, yay! So they go down to this planet. We get a little bit of exposition. The planet's going to self-destruct, so we're going to scan it. Cool exploration and watching things explode are both neat things. What's not neat is going down and seeing a whole bunch of people who've died under strange circumstances. Huh. You know what I should do in this strange circumstance where we've been down in isolation suits in order to examine the circumstance? I'm going to go and take off my glove to scratch my face. Now that's already stupid. What gets even stupider is he doesn't put the glove back on. He then decides to reach around and try to figure out what's going on and gets infected. Then he puts the glove back on. This is stupid on every possible level. <laughs> then Spock comes in and he has to deliver a dun-dun-da. We're dealing with something we've never dealt with before. And delivers the line just like that, too. And it's just like, oh, my God. What was Nimoy thinking when he had to deliver that line? <laughs> Gosh. So, we see that the transporter can decontaminate. That's a first. And then we see stress with Joey. Tormelin. He's, he's freaking out over the thing. He's like, oh my god, and everything's gone badly, and it's so horrible, and we, aren't, we weren't meant to be out here. Those people died. I'm only pointing it out because, once again, we see human beings dealing with stress is actually kind of interesting in Star Trek. It's just... In this case, the only reason he's doing that is because he's currently drugged, so that it loses some of the impact. What we do see is that indicator thing. Remember I mentioned the knuckle back in the man trap? Well, this time it's the, you know, the, the, the snake rattle thing, and also the hand. So they actually have an audio and a visual indicator of people who are infected, so that's cool. We also set up the danger. The planet is not only collapsing, but for those of you who haven't actually figured out what that means, it means that the mass is altering as well, which doesn't actually make any kind of sense, but let's ignore that for the moment. And so the gravity is shifting, which actually that would make sense, and all sorts of fun stuff is happening. So they're, And they need to maintain a tight orbit to make sure their scanners get as much information as possible. Okay. Sure, I'm, I'm with all that. Whatever. Then we see Riley show up. All right. 
I mentioned Leslie a few episodes ago. How many of you know Riley, just from me saying the name? Riley was actually intended to be a regular character like Leslie became. It's just he uh, didn't work out for whatever reason. I couldn't find an, an explanation given. It's just he wasn't called back after Conscience of the King. So he's only in two episodes, this one and Conscience of the King. Bit of a shame. He also mentions fencing. And then we have Joey flipping completely out and attempting to commit suicide. Oh, I suppose I should say successfully committing suicide because he does die. So that's neat. You know, you know, I mentioned over on Enterprise, uh, spoilers for Enterprise, I suppose, that nobody dies on Enterprise. None of the main characters, none of the crew of Enterprise dies until Season 3. Now, that was a deliberate attempt to avoid what was established all the way back in TOS. You'll notice that we've already had in the dozen-ish range of deaths on the show so far. I, I should be keeping track, but honestly, it's already a large number. <laughs> Like, they had nine people die and where no man has gone before, for God's sakes. People are just falling over left and right on this show. Yeah, we're going to kill people, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just poking fun. It's just amusing to see the contrast. Anyways, we haven't even had our first red shirt yet. Don't worry, I'll point it out when we do. So, we also see the first hypospray. That's cool. We, the, oh, we get another weirdness. This is This is always so weird to me. We get so many captain's logs that are in past tense. This was actually, I, I, I looked this up, this is a deliberate thing. The whole idea is the captain's log is the log that he is sending back to command after the episode's done. So he is reciting the events of the episode rather than it being a log that he's recording at the moment, which is how it's used in every other show from this point onwards. It's just it's weird. It keeps it keeps throwing me. Unbeknownst to us, we have been invaded by a thing. And, I, and just my first reaction is, wait, what? How do you know that? Oh, right, future, future, got it, or technically the past, but we'll get there in a minute. So Riley starts to wig out, and George Takei has the foil, which is awesome. And then there's this nice little bit where Kirk obviously cares about the mission, but the moment he realizes things are in danger, let's get out of here. Get me out of orbit right now. We're getting the heck out of Dodge, because the safety of the ship and the safety of the crew come first. As usual, I like that. This is not the first time that's come up. By the way, this is a good time to mention something. The actual episode calls what they're doing being drunk. And yet it's worth noting, and it's hard not to compare this, comparing this to Naked Now, where they do mostly act like they're drunk or have some kind of hangover, here they just act, and I think uh, Spock said this best, irrationally. This is key. I don't think they even did this on purpose. But the catch is, irrational people don't react in ways that can be predicted. That's kind of how that works. You can't really reason with someone who is legitimately irrational. Um, it's it's a whole thing. I don't even know how to describe it. If any of you have studied mental health and are far more versed in it than I have, I uh, am only a distant, barely aware of the concepts thing, but I, I've, I've seen and studied in some small ways exactly how you're supposed to deal with someone who is legitimately irrational, where their brain just is not actually connecting properly. It's like it's like when you're asleep, but also not aware of the fact that you're asleep. In other words, a normal dream, not a lucid dream, because the, the part of your brain that connects things isn't actually functioning at the time, so instead it's just kind of going, woo and things just happen in ways that make sense to you, but with a rational mind, you look if you were to look back at it, you'd be like, what? That doesn't make any sense. That's not even, like, symbolic. That's just weird. That's what it's like trying to, to reason with an irrational mind. This is the funny part, though, and this is where things get really horrible. Irrational does not mean incompetent. They do not suddenly lose the ability to drive or to do their jobs or operate the, you know, an, an equipment or whatever. This is then the exact threat and danger they face here. They have all these people who are irrational but can still operate things like Riley does in the engine room. So, nice threat setup, actually. It's almost ironic because the ticking clock of the planet actually feels secondary to the threat of the ship's been taken over by loonies. By the way, another first, because I'm just going to keep pointing these out, first time the ship is taken over completely by engineering. This would actually become a very long-standing trend to the point where it's considered normal that you can control the entire ship from engineering if you have to. That actually became a plot point many times in future Star Treks. Anyways... 
So, they have to get through the wall. I do like how they mention going through the wall circuits. In other words, in, they don't want to just cut straight through the wall because there's a lot of you know, circuitry and, and wires in there that they don't just want to go... <laughs> so that makes a degree of sense and would make more sense if this wasn't a dire situation. Here's a thought. Why don't they just beam in? Uh, maybe he shut down the, the transporters because he's in engineering. Okay, here's a thought. Why don't they just blast the door open? They have phasers. They have three of them, which they are armed with when they charge in to take Riley. Why don't they just shoot the door open? They're a little bit time-crunched here. What? I said I wouldn't make fun with regards to future Trek stuff or things that haven't been established yet, but we already know phasers can blow open doors. That happened in the cage. Twice. Anyways. <clears throat> so. This then leads to Chapel. I already talked about her for the most part. <laughs> She's in love with Spock. I, I feel so bad for Angel Barrett. Um, Spock loses control. And what's actually really interesting is that scene was not in the script originally. The bit where Spock laments and, and you know, ah, oh, my emotions and blah, blah, blah. That was, originally that was supposed to be something a little bit more comical. That was axed by, uh, by Nimoy's request himself. Nimoy actually had to go to Roddenberry, who then forced Black to change it. Go figure. And because of scheduling issues, they only had time for one take. So the take you are seeing is the first time Nimoy, Nimoy actually got down and did the run. Does a good job of it. It's not quite as powerful as the scene in Sarek, where Sarek breaks down. But I do have to say, I, I got a lot of vibes of that scene when I was watching it. Good stuff, good stuff. And this is actually where I'm going to pause, talk about the episode proper, and mention why this episode works so much better for me. Unless I already said that, in which case, please forgive me for repeating myself. It's a character piece. Naked Now was about how differently everyone was being and how much everyone was going completely zany, you know, wacko. And one of the things I complained about that was you need to establish a crew before you can show changed personalities, you know. Season 2 at the earliest. I mentioned this in Enterprise. I will mention this in Farscape. This came up in Deep Space Nine. It's a thing where you need to establish your characters before you show the variants for the variants to have any significance, right? Here's the catch. They're not really acting differently here. Oh, I know, they are. But that's not the point. The point is not that they are off. The point is they are done in a very specific way to, to showcase their mentality. This is done to actually add to the characterization of the characters, most notably in Spock and Kirk, which is funny because Spock's is brilliantly done and Kirk's is extremely ham-fisted. Huh. <laughs> so it works for me a lot better. This then leads to that wonderful quote, I kind of change the laws of physics, which is, I swear, one of his most quotable quotes. I'd say probably his second most quotable quotes after the one that everyone misquotes. You know the one. So then they say they have to, to mix the matter-antimatter in a specific ratio in order to, you know, they need an intermix formula in order to in cause an implosion. I was going to make fun of this since we all know there's only one ratio of matter-to-antimatter, one-to-one. One. But then I realized, well, maybe mixing it in a different thing could cause an implosion. Maybe that's the whole point. Hmm. At that point, though, does it, man, hmm... How would you figure out exactly how much you need? I guess Spock is a super genius, so we're just going to let it go. Uh, so, Spock infects Kirk. Kirk gets infected in seconds. My ship. My ship, I love my ship, but I love Rand. I need Rand. And, okay, I've talked before that I can and have seen William Shatner act well. This is not one of those instances. This, in total contrast to Nimoy, who's killing it as Spock, this is just... What? A beautiful woman. I, I, I won't lose you. I won't. No beach. Oh, God, no beach. <sighs> Why? Why is a captain of a starship not allowed to have romance in his life? Or her life, as the case may be. I'm just curious where that idea comes from. Certainly there are very valid reasons not to fraternize with your own crew. That's the don't sleep around the office concept, which has many, many reasons for existing. But 
I mean, Cisco managed it just fine with Cassidy. <laughs> just to name one example right off the top of my head. You could say that Janeway had it too, it's just then, you know, she decided to get stranded on the other side of the galaxy. So, why? And, and I'm actually asking you guys, if any of you have an answer to this, I'd be curious to know your answers and exactly why you think. This is something they wrote in. Because it's worth noting that another thing they wrote in is that women can't be captains at this point in history, so that's nonsense too. Anyways, <clears throat> so, they do the Intermix, and they go back in time! Ladies and gentlemen, this is what, like five firsts now? This is our first time travel in Star Trek. Now this is interesting. So they go back a few days because they do this intermix formula and it causes the matter and to explode and they go, time, yay, and they go back three days. It feels like such an unnecessary addition until I realized why it's there. It was there to introduce the idea of time travel to the show at the end of this episode so that were they to time travel in the future, say, I don't know, 15 episodes from now, that it would be okay. The, you know, the audience would be like, aha, they can time travel on this show. You know, just opening the door on that particular science fiction concept. Okay. What's really funny is I decided to look this up. There's a list of all of the different methods of time travel, as in the method by which they time travel, used throughout Star Trek history. This method, the engine implosion, is never used again. Not counting books, which I don't have a list of. I just found that funny for some reason. They use the slingshot method the most. That seems to be like the norm, is they slingshot around stuff. That was even used in the movie. Anyways, that's all I got. Surprisingly good episode, which is good to know. We're getting into some better episodes, which means we're about due for a terrible one. Which, which one is next? I, it doesn't matter, because I will see you guys there next week.